Welcome back to today's episode of CIO Water Cooler TV. I'm your host, Neil C. Hughes, and today I want to explore the topic of intelligent automation. And I've invited Faisal to join me today in a conversation about all this and much more. Now, he is the UK Managing Director at Cyclum, and we've got lots to talk about today. So, enough from me. So, a huge welcome to CIO Water Cooler. Could you tell me a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, hi, Neil. Thanks for inviting me. So, my name's Faisal Wiftika. Uh, I'm the Managing Director of Cyclum. Uh, so, Cyclum are an organization that looks to help businesses reimagine the way they work uh, through the use of digital transformation and digital journeys. Um, my background is, so I've been with Cyclum for three years. Prior to Cyclum, I was, a, I was a partner at IBM. And then prior to that, I was at British Telecom, where I had my industry experience. And then I earned my con- uh, stripes in the big four consulting. So I started my career off at Ernst & Young and had a stint at Deloitte as well. Well, a huge warm welcome. There's so many things I was excited to get you on to talk about today, especially around intelligent automation, because it is a huge topic right now. But it's been something that's been around for much longer than many people watching might think. So can you walk me through a brief evolution of intelligent automation and the value that it's bringing businesses? Yes, I mean, automation, very passionate about this. Um, I mean, I got involved in in automation from 2015 through the rise of uh, robotic process automation. And this is when I was at when I was at BT. Um, and I just saw the benefits that you could drive through through RPA. But but it's automation's been around for ages, right? So if we think of kind of macros, SQLs, um, all scripts, we've been running those since kind of since the 90s, so even earlier than that. Uh, so automation has always been around, but it just hasn't been controlled or scalable. RPA coming in in kind of uh, 2015 kind of changed the game and the way we look at automation um, and what benefits that we can drive from it. So since the introduction of RPA in 2015, what organizations have been doing since they've implemented RPA is start combining it with other technologies to kind of coin the terminology intelligent automation. So whether you're combining RPA with an intelligent document processing tool or whether you're combining it with a low-code tool or whether you're combining it with a conversational AI tool, combination of those tools is what we call intelligent automation or others call hyper automation as well. And that's where you get some really good benefits. And since 2020, organizations have been really driving this at scale and driving them good benefits on the back of it. And I'm curious, from all the conversations that you're having with your customers, how are organizations typically starting their journey with automation here in 2023? Because as you said, so much has changed since the night is, and a lot of attitudes have changed as well. But where do they typically begin the journey right now? Yeah, so, I mean, there's three types of conversations that I'm having with, with, with organizations at the moment. The first are organizations that have been doing something in the automation space. And they want to try and evolve it further and almost either turbocharge it or take it to the next level. And those organizations have either just piloted kind of one tool um, or one particular technology. And it's typically usually robotic process automation. And they're saying, well, how do we take it now from just doing RPA and now scaling it out to intelligent automation? So that's usually conversation number one. And a lot of organizations have already kind of dabbled with, with, with RPA. And then Garner did a study um, just two years ago we'd said by 2025, over 97% of organizations will have done a form of RPA or not. So yeah, most organizations have done that. So conversation number one is typically about, we've made a start on this, now how do we turbocharge this and do intelligent automation? The second type of conversation is typically around, we've not started this at all, mm-hmm. and where do we actually begin? Um, and we always say, you know, we look at it from a patterns-based perspective. So when you're looking at a process end-to-end, um, you could t- typically tap in a technology that automates a particular task or a function of the process. But if you combine multiple tools and technologies together, you can automate the process end-to-end, touchless. Um, so organizations are therefore kind of going for that whole, let's do a proof of value of taking a pain point or a problem that we've got in our organization and how do we make that process absolutely touchless um, going forward. And then the third one, um, how organizations are starting off as well, is where organizations have got new business models that have come into play, new processes that have come into play, and they've gone for an automation first approach rather than let's just build a manual process and then we'll automate it later. Um, So new business models, new processes, and let's just try and automate it straight away. So it's typically starting with a pain point 
and then going for the automation straight away. So from those same conversations that you're having, what are the big challenges that many organizations are facing when talking about intelligent automation? Are there any trends there around the kind of things that they're coming and asking you for help with? Yeah, so um, typically what organizations have done is uh, they've, they've typically deployed one technology um, and started trying to automate their business through the, through, through the use of one technology. Now, intelligent automation is, is more of a multifaceted approach using multiple different technologies. And the main challenge that organizations come up with is what other technologies should we use um, and how do we make the right decisions around vendor selection? So that's kind of typical challenge number one it is all around that. Challenge number two is around the benefits case and driving benefits um, through automation. So uh, when when RPA came out in, in 2015, um, I think a lot of organizations almost saw it as a silver bullet where they believed they could get 40, 50, 60 percent levels of efficiency through RPA. It, it really turned out to be kind of more around the 10 to 15 percent through RPA. Um, but now as RPA has become a lot more sophisticated and combining RPA with the low-code technologies, with the intelligent document processing, with conversational AI, and now overlaying that with process mining as well, organizations are able to kind of drive towards those 50, 60% efficiency savings that they were that they were ambitiously targeting way back in 2015. And I'm so glad you mentioned conversational AI there because AI has officially entered the mainstream this year. It's all anyone's talking about. So how are you seeing everything from conversational AI to generative AI taking intelligent automation to another level? There's a lot of talk about it, a lot of excitement, but what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it almost forms part of every single conversation, not even yeah. business, externally as well, right? All personal conversations, are everyone's talking about generative AI, and it is a really exciting space, not just generative AI, but just AI in general and how it kind of tees off quite nicely with intelligent automation. So where is kind of, you know, traditional AI, uh, used to be using uh, data sets and trying to detect patterns in those existing data sets. And that combining that with intelligent automation is extremely powerful. So if you've got these intelligent workflows and then you've got these predictive analytics overlaying it, you can then kind of work out what's going to happen within your business, which is which is really clever. Generative AI takes it to the next level where generative AI is actually creating data now for your business. So it kind of takes it to the next level from a content creation perspective, from a data simulation perspective, new business models. It really makes data available to your business. Um, and the proliferation of data over the last kind of you know, five, 10 years, it's, it's, it's extremely hot. And that's why all organizations are talking to us about it. Um, and right now, what organizations are doing at the moment is, is very much in the experimenting phase. How can we bring generative AI into our business um, and make data accessible for our for our business. Now, there are so many different emerging technologies in this field at the moment. There's, can you talk to me a little about some of those technologies around intelligent automation, just to further bring this topic to life? Yeah, so um, we always look again for more from a patterns-based perspective. Um, and every process, we say, follows kind of different types of patterns, whether you're reading and interpreting for something, whether you're in executing a task, whether you're workflowing something or whether you're conversing with somebody. So each of the different patterns, we typically say there's a technology that underpins it. So from a reading and interpreting, you've got intelligent document processing, or traditionally what people will remember as OCR technology, which is taking unstructured data and making that structured. From carrying out tasks, we say use your robotic process automation uh, tools to actually carry out those tasks, whether they're rules-based repetitive tasks or whether they're following kind of different types of transactional uh, tasks that, that need to be that need to be performed. We then say that there's work for workflow tasks. Uh, we say use low code applications, which kind of holds processes together um, and kind of can low, the, these, these low code technologies enable you to um, interact internally, but also externally as well. So not only does it, does it hold the process together, but it also kind of helps you interact with external and internally within a business. And then from a conversational AI perspective, we've got a lot of kind of virtual virtual agents out there as well. So they're, they're the conversational AI bit comes into that. So they're the kind of different types of patterns that you can apply to a process to kind of automate it end to end. Now, un overlaying all of that as well, we've got the emergence of process mining as well. Now, process mining effectively helps you understand your processes 
much better than you've ever been able to understand them. So historically, we you've had to map processes out manually and kind of do time and motion studies manually. Process mining technology using the day using system logs helps you understand how your processes are mapped end to end, where those bottlenecks are, and how you can tweak those processes and measure the the, the benefits of tweaking those processes as well. So kind of process mining really sits across the intelligent automation stack and works hand in hand with all of your automation technologies. Now we're seeing process mining, um, the emergence of it uh, can come upon uh, quite greatly. So a lot of organizations that are talking to us about intelligent automation are talking to us now about process mining as well, because by doing a process mine, it really helps you understand where those pain points and bottlenecks are within your business and where you need to automate your processes. So really, really hot at the moment, process mining. And we are seeing a lot of changes, especially around economic uncertainty at the moment. A lot of businesses challenged with doing more with less. And there's a, a much stronger focus on the business value and ROI of every new tech project. So can you share any stats or, or maybe use cases that can bring this topic to life and highlight that business value of intelligent automation too? Because that's what it's all about, essentially, right? It is, it is. But I, I always say that um, when you're looking at uh, automation, you should always look at it from a more balanced scorecard perspective or a multifaceted benefits perspective and kind of categorize it into different different buckets. Financial absolutely is very important uh, part of doing an automation program because, of, as you rightly said, the return on investments. So when you're looking at it from a financial perspective, it's not just the efficiency or the cost saving element of it. It's also the revenue generation part of it as well. So by having a more streamlined process in the background, it also helps generate revenue for your businesses as well. But I always say that don't look at uh, an automation program just from that financial angle. You should look at it from a customer perspective as well. So your customer experience, how is automation going to really evolve your customer experience and evolve your customer journeys? But not only just your customers, but what about from employee perspective as well? How does employees, how, do, how does automation enhance what our employees are doing at the moment, take away a lot of those mundane, um, non-value added tasks and free up capacity for individuals to be focusing on value added tasks. And immediately you kind of get a much more uptake of productivity just with that alone. But then you should also see it from a compliance perspective as well. By automating these processes, you're making your, um, you're also enhancing your whole controls framework. Your uh, processes, uh, compliance levels are, are, are a lot more higher. They're a lot more controlled. And all of these processes are really well documented as well now, uh, something which businesses have been challenged with over the last kind of 10, 15 years. So automation has really driven uh, not just the financial savings, but a benefits on a multifaceted approach. And Neil, you mentioned, you know, what kind of benefits are we seeing uh, to the table? So when we looked at it from a, you know, one technology perspective or one pattern perspective, you typically were just seeing, you know, kind of the 15, 20% efficiency gains single digit million um, uh, benefits, uh, return on investment was typically within 12 months. But what we're beginning to see now with intelligent automation, where you are using multiple technologies, um, we're seeing kind of benefits in the tens of millions uh, at this moment in time. Efficiencies are, you know, sometimes 50, 60, 70% of pro. And this is because processes can be automated end to end. You can actually make them touchless now with the technologies that are available. And for every CIO that's watching our conversation today, their mission is to drive value through transforming and reimagining their processes using intelligent automation technologies. But then they're bombarded by so many different partners out there, all probably promising AI, saying the right things, etc. It can be very difficult to make the right choice. So what should they consider before choosing a partner? Yeah, so, so, so I would say there's three things that they should consider when, when choosing a partner. Um, the first thing is the partner needs to have a good track record of delivering intelligent automation uh, at scale. Very important. And intelligent automation is very different from just kind of one technology automation, multiple technology automation. So the track record and experience is extremely important. So pick a partner that's got the stripes, got the learnings, and can help you scale. The second thing I would say is pick a partner that's going to co-create with you and collaborate with you and build your capability internally. These technologies aren't going away and they're going to continuously keep evolving. It's really important for organizations to build their own capability. So picking a partner that can take them on a journey, 
and build your capability is extremely important. And then the final one I would say is look for a partner that is forward thinking and innovative in this space. The, te the technologies are always evolving and they need to be one step ahead of the game. So picking a partner that can help you trial and experiment with new technologies and keep you one step ahead of your competition is extremely pertinent for what you're trying to achieve. So they're the kind of three things that I would say are really important for when you're picking a partner for automation. So much gold in everything that you're saying there. So many big, valuable takeaways. And I also suspect much of what you were talking about, they will resonate with CIOs listening and watching all over the world. So uh, more than anything, though, just a big thank you for taking the time to sit down with me today and share some of those insights. Uh, Neil, thank you so much for inviting me. And I hope the CIOs do found this segment uh, valuable. And a big thank you to each and every one of you for tuning into this conversation today. And please take a look around the website, subscribe to our channel on YouTube, where you'll find a wealth of content just like this for you to explore. But thank you for watching today. <laughs>